so that we might bring honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's his, in his name that we pray. Amen. I've entitled the message, Christ, Our Example of a Suffering Servant. It's interesting, um, when you look at the designations for Jesus in the Old Testament, one of the most important and common amongst the prophets is the Lord's servant. Now, I mention that because throughout the book of Isaiah, the servant of the Lord is clearly designated in some of these passages to be Jesus Christ. And what a servant he was. Willing to take upon human flesh, frailty, setting aside the independent use of his attributes for the purpose of which he was called, and that was to go to the cross and pay for sin. He understood what a servant was. Jesus' last words spoken directly to Peter are found in John's Gospel. They address Peter after an unsuccessful night of fishing when the Lord told the disciples where to cast their net. Cast it over on this side of the boat. And they did. It was a huge catch of fish. Jesus was on the shore having built a fire and he was preparing a meal for the disciples. The question is, why did Peter decide to go fishing in the first place? Some suggest that Peter just could not shake off the lingering guilt associated with the denials of Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed. The thought being that he was just going to go back to where he was comfortable, to do what he knew, But Jesus had other plans for Peter. It states that when they came, they had breakfast with the apostles. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend to my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. With singular focus, the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected shepherd of our souls, says to his under shepherd, shepherd my lambs, shepherd my sheep, tend to my sheep. Why? I believe he was calling Peter to a recommitment. Time for Peter to dial back in to his calling as one of the apostles. And what an apostle he was. You know, when you look at the life of Peter, it's really pretty clear in Scripture His life while Jesus was on earth is one phase. Some mistakes made, yes. His life after the ascension, when he was called by God to open the hearts of Israel on the day of Pentecost, and to stand firm and bold in the midst of persecution. But when you take it to the latter part of Peter's life, approximately 35 years after his denial of Jesus. You see a Peter who is firmly rooted on being God's shepherd, not just in one location, 
but throughout the Roman world to encourage God's sheep to persevere, especially in the midst of suffering. And this was the most challenging time in church history up to this point. For it was Nero, the Roman emperor, who had decided out of his ego to burn down significant portions of Rome. And he blamed it upon Christians. Christians, therefore, were viewed by many with not only skepticism, but an attitude of hatred. And people began to persecute Christians. How do Christians respond in the midst of such hatred, vitriol? How do they respond when they are treated such? Well, we know that the words of Peter run contrary to a lot of what, quite frankly, we as Americans want to think. Now, we have the mantra in America of, I'm a self-made man. But we must remember one thing. When it comes to kingdom work, Jesus said it very clearly. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. This morning... We want to pick up where Pastor Ron left off last week. Pastor Ron set forth two principles. Submission is required of servants toward masters, and submission is rewarded. Required, but it will be rewarded. This morning, there is a little outline in your bulletins. Servants are reminded of two realities that will enable them to live faithfully amidst unjust suffering. And the first reality is this, to recognize that servants are called for a specific purpose, for a specific purpose. Now, a reminder, these are household slaves. Pastor Ron mentioned that they were numerous categories of slaves in the New Testament era. Uh, Some were basically captives from war. They were given the most difficult tasks, put in mines, used to build roads, used to build buildings. There were other slaves who were basically farmers for their masters. And the ones that we're looking at were household slaves. That is, they were more domestic. Something had happened. Something had happened between the order from Nero to persecute Christians and servants, household slaves, and their masters. I don't know exactly what it was, but I have a suspicion that the owners of the slaves did not like the fact that their servants were now giving allegiance, a higher allegiance, to some god named Jesus. Some god that was really not reverence. There were no statues of Jesus, at least at this point. And likely they began to institute measures to assure that their household servants would be managed in an effective way. It states, you, in verse 21, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Now that word you, it points back to the 18th verse. Excuse me. It it points back to um, the, the 18th verse. 
to where we see servants is the reference there. You, the servants, have been called for this purpose. And might I add, I think it's true for all of God's children. Because the purpose is specific. You have been called. This is what we call a passive verb. It means the action was done by somebody else on to the person. Those who are called to be servants for this purpose were called by none other than God himself. And this is a sovereign reality. God was the one who called them for this purpose. God was the one who put them in a situation to be used. And it is a reminder to us that salvation from beginning all the way to glorification involves the calling of God, calling us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The call in the New Testament epistles is the efficacious call to salvation. But Peter points to something a little bit different. He reminds these servants that they have been called to unjust treatment. Use that in your evangelistic attempts next time. Hey, would you like to trust Jesus and experience persecution? Would you like to suffer and pick up your cross daily? But you know what? Jesus actually did talk about that. He who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. You were called for this purpose. Well, what purpose? To be harshly treated, verse 20. Harshly treated? Called to be harshly treated? Yes, just like I was. Jesus is saying this. Jesus was intimately aware of the calling of these servants. He had trod the path prior to these servants trotting the same path. But he's intimately acquainted with everything that these servants were going to go through. And he, by the way, he is intimately acquainted with everything we go through. How intimately acquainted was he? I'm going to give you one example. The story of Stephen. You remember Stephen. He was the first martyr who was stoned to death. Here's what it says in Acts chapter 7. Stephen said, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and in ears, and you're always resisting the Holy Spirit, you are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you did not keep it. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. And they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Why was Jesus standing? I thought he was seated at the right hand of God because his work was finished. He stood because his righteous one, Stephen, was standing the calling of being martyred. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and they covered their ears, and they rushed at him with one impulse. 
when they had driven out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul, who we know became the Apostle Paul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Does Jesus understand suffering? Was he on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Listening to the very words almost identical come out of the mouth of Stephen. Yes, he's very familiar with suffering servants. There were others who suffered unjustly. Think of the story of Joseph, who was sold into slavery after certain brothers convinced the other brothers, now we ought not to kill him. We'll we'll just sell him into slavery. And we'll take his robe and we'll put blood on it. We'll tell our father that a wild beast killed him. That whole ordeal ended up being the salvation of Jacob's family, Jacob's 12 sons. And the mercy that Joseph evidenced said this, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many alive. Also the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Dave read part of it today. How many times Does Hebrews 11 point to the fact of those who had to live by faith amidst suffering? Some thrown to wild beasts, some cut with saws, as many believe Isaiah was. The second reality. Servants are called to follow Christ's example. In verse 21, the second part of the verse, I'll read the whole verse. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Since Christ also suffered for you. Jesus is the greatest leader that ever lived, He was the, according to Hebrews chapter 12, he was the pioneer and trailblazer of those who follow the faith. I think of great leaders. In the movie, We Were Soldiers, Mel Gibson, who played the leading role as Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, was commissioned to introduce the first mechanized helicopter battalion in the Vietnam War. He told all of his men this memorable quote, quote, I can't promise that I'll bring you all home alive, but this I swear before you and before Almighty God that when we go into battle, I will be the first to set foot on the field and I will be the last to step off. And I will leave no one behind. Dead or alive, we will all come home to God together. So help me God. Now, if I were a soldier, I'd be following that man. But you know what? We are soldiers. And we have a greater commander. Jesus Christ. And we're in war every single day. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author or pioneer and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. 
who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you would not grow weary and lose heart. Leaving us an example. Leaving us an example. The word example is is a Greek word that means to be under. Writing under. So in effect what an example would be would be like a document that you would take another piece of paper and put over that document and you would trace what is under. You'd be tracing the example. Jesus lived the life that we need to emulate. He lived as an example, thus a pattern for Christians to follow in suffering with perfect patience. We need to follow in his steps, it says. Follow in his steps. Now, of my four children, when we had a good snow, I would like to go out with my kids and sometimes they'd walk in deep snow. And of course, I was six foot three with size 13 boots. Now, Ruth might have been, you know, some three-year-old, four-year-old. But I always told my kids in deep snow, walk in my footsteps. And I would take small steps and I'd walk and they could walk in my steps and they could get through the snow. If they had to make their own path, it'd be very difficult. If we had to make our own path on following Christ, it would be very difficult. We need to be in his steps. We need to follow his steps. We need to follow his example. And what did Jesus' example look like? Well, Jesus gave the example through his life and his suffering of one who would persevere. Listen to what it says. He committed no sin. That's what it says in verse 22. He committed no sin. Is that worth following? I ask you. Yes, it is. We were reminded in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, that very fact. Knowing that you were not redeemed by perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Jesus committed no sin, and that's the example that we need to follow. We need to be like Jesus. Don't commit sin. Don't respond to masters in a way that will defame the Lord Jesus Christ. It also says that no deceit was found in his mouth. No deceit. No taking advantage through craftiness or underhanded methods, deceit, cunning, or treachery. Well, that's, that's a convicting thing. No deceit. Have you ever held back from being truthful? Have you ever deceived somebody to gain advantage? Have you ever been deceitful so that your pride would not be humiliated because of the truthfulness of your sins? Jesus is the example. Another thing about Jesus, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. There was plenty of abusive speech, threats, and vile words used against Jesus. But he did not respond in like manner. 
Can you imagine being the creator of the universe, standing before your countrymen, you being the Messiah, the creator, bringing the promise of salvation and being so ruthlessly treated, spoken evil against, being reviled with abusive speech, threats, vile words used to truly put down Jesus. He didn't revile in return. Well, that's a hard thing sometimes to deal with. Sometimes you feel like striking back. Sometimes you feel like quitting. Of course, these household servants didn't have that as an option. What they needed to do was come to the point of trusting in the pattern of Jesus. And that's hard. While suffering, he uttered no threats. While suffering, he uttered no threats. He didn't curse. He didn't act in a vile way. He accepted their unjust treatment of himself for a purpose. So that he would not violate himself and thus violate his being the pure, spotless Lamb of God. I remember one of my favorite theologians, John Murray. I was reading him on the passive and active obedience of Christ. The act of obedience was obeying the law of God, the Ten Commandments, being virtuous. The passive obedience was living amongst sinful people. Every day. Regardless of what you think about some people, and maybe your standard is better than theirs, Trust me, when it comes to Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God, and he lived amongst us, and he lived amongst people who cursed him, who hated him, who had no interest in the things of God. Yes, that's my Jesus. It says in chapter 2 and verse 23, toward the end of the verse, he kept entrusting himself to him, that is the Father, who judges righteously. Now, to entrust has the idea of commissioning whatever it is to somebody else to care for. He entrusted himself, his emotion, his unjust treatment to the Father. Why? Because he knew that the Father is worth trusting. He is the one who judges righteously. Jesus was not a striker. Although, He could have called 10,000 angels. Although, he could have immediately cast those people down. He did not. His perfect confidence in the sovereignty and righteousness of the Father is what characterized his trust and his reliance upon God. Jesus lived his life entrusting himself to the Father. We, likewise, are to be entrusting ourselves to the Father. 
Yeah, but you don't understand. I know I don't understand. But Jesus does. He was also virtuous in his response to suffering and adversity directed toward him. Likewise, we are called to imitate the example that Jesus demonstrated through submission to the Father's will. And you might say, yeah, but, but Jesus was God in the flesh. It's hard submitting to things that are really being put in my path. Yeah, that's true. But you're called to do it anyway. Jesus endured verbal and physical abuse. He was impugned unjustly. He committed no crimes or in any way sinned. His mind was set upon God's will in thought and in deed. Do you remember what it says in Hebrews? That he was tempted in all parts like as we, yet without sin. Now the Apostle Peter in verses 24 and 25, he kind of gives a little bit different nuance of the life of Christ. He says, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Bearing our sins in his body on the cross is the means of salvation designed by God. We call this substitutionary atonement. Now, if we were the architects of salvation, we would not have designed salvation to be purchased or accomplished in such a way. We would have come up with some more convenient plan. Something that we can negotiate. But there was no negotiation. There was only one plan that would work. And that plan was for the Lord Jesus Christ to be called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, to be recognized by his Father on several occasions. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well pleased. The purpose, the example of Jesus Christ in taking our sin upon himself was to take our sins far away. He was our substitute. I remember as a new Christian, probably only a year old in the Lord, I came across a little book that Pastor Marian Thomas gave me. It was called The Faith by S. Lewis Bauman, an old brother and pastor from California. And I learned a word that I never forgot. Vicarious atonement. Vicarious. I never heard that word before. So I had to give a dictionary out and look it up. Substitutionary. Taking my place. His death for me. And it made the gospel even clearer to a novice, for my mind was just learning a little bit about the vocabulary of of the Bible. But I understood vicarious. And it helped me explain the gospel to people. One of the men that I shared the gospel with, now with the Lord, was Gary Perkins from Da Vinci's Coffee House and Art Shop. I remember Gary came over and I was so excited about Jesus, I had to tell everybody. And I told Gary about vicarious atonement. I probably sounded intelligent. (laughs) 
Probably. But I explained to him what that really meant. And he was raised in a, in, in a church, had never really come to faith in Christ. And when he understood vicarious atonement, he said, I really want to trust Jesus too. Such an important truth. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. And then he says in verse 24, the second part, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now Paul, or Peter, is saying all this to encourage servants to submit to their masters looking at how Jesus, God's servant, submitted to the Father's plan even though it was difficult, even though it would be painful, and even though he would experience death. So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now I believe what this this uh, clause is saying, and we're talking about the redemptive nature of sanctification. That is, we're talking about how when we identify with Christ by faith, we enter into his death and we also enter into his resurrection. That guarantees that there will be a change of life. If there's no change of life, there probably isn't any salvation. You hear me on that? We have been risen to walk in new life, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Praise God for that. Lives are changed through the power of the gospel. And he goes on to say, for by his wounds you were healed. Now some have taken this this latter part here, for by his wounds you were healed, and they they try to use that verse to... um, explain some kind of Pentecostal, charismatic, uh, faith healing. That's not what it's referring to. It's referring to the healing of our souls. His death, his wounds healed our souls. Now I'll tell you what it does have a reference to. The resurrection. The granting of new bodies. Yes, in that sense. Jesus did all this as a demonstration and example for us. Now, what happens in the life of believers? What happens in the life of servants who submit to the will of God the Father? Well, he says in verse 25, you were continually straying like sheep. This is a quote from Isaiah 53 and verse 6, where the description of humanity is depicted as straying like sheep without a shepherd. And it is a reminder to these servants, look where you were. Look where you were before you knew Christ. Look where you're at now. The phrase, you were continually straying like sheep, describes, by analogy, the wayward, purposelessness, dangerous, and helpless wandering of lost sinners. Understand what what is being stated here. This is what we were, if we're honest. We were straying like sheep, sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus says this in chapter 9 and verse 36. He said, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Verse 
wandering, lost, sinful. It's good to go back, revisit where you come from. Total depravity, totally without any hope in the world. In preparing for my Sunday school class today, I came across this quote, John Eady, a 19th century Scottish preacher said, men without Christ are death walking. The beauties of holiness do not attract men in his moral insensibility, nor do miseries of hell deter him. You can talk to him about heaven. He's not interested. You can talk to him about hell. He's not afraid. John MacArthur said, now this kind of man doesn't need renewal. This kind of man doesn't need repair. This kind of man doesn't need restoration. Resuscitation. This kind of man needs resurrection. He needs life because he's dead. Amen. You were continually straying like sheep. That's the way these servants were, and Peter is reminding them that if they're truly disciples of the Master, that's where they were at. But, the rest of this verse says, but now, but now. It's interesting, in, in, in the, the Greek, the, the word that is used for but here is a very strong word. It's a very contrasting word. He says, but now, you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Remember that, servants. Remember that because Christ was submissive, he accomplished all this on behalf of you. And we can say on behalf of us as well. Amen? Amen. He says, now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Peter's calling attention to where those servants are because of Jesus. You have returned. How did they return? This is important. Did they find in their own strength the ability to return? Did they muster up some kind of courage? No, it's a passive verb which implies this. You have returned by somebody acting upon you. Namely, God the Father, through the death of Christ, through the application of redemption, through the Holy Spirit drawing you. You have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Peter's calling attention to the present state of these servants. We're saved. We are in proximity of relationship with the great shepherd and with the guardian of our souls. Wow. This is a reminder for all Christians that we need to remember our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to remember it. Those servants needed to remember it. This is especially true when times are difficult, and they certainly were during the persecution under Nero. The verb rendered have returned carries the connotation of repentance. A turning from sin and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter renders that they had trusted in Christ's substitutionary death and they turned to him for salvation. If you've made that decision, it's because God prompted you through the Holy Spirit. 
worked upon you. Honestly, look at yourself. Can you say that you had desired these things apart from hearing the Word of God and the Spirit of God working in our lives? Of course not. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Now he concludes this section with the phrase, you were returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Now this is a comforting, comforting phrase. We just haven't been saved in some idealistic way. We've been saved in proximity to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our shepherd and the guardian of our souls. Don't ever think you're alone. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But I don't feel like he's with me. Your feelings really aren't the issue. The issue is his promise. His promise. The passage makes it very clear that the Christian submission to the means that God has revealed in Peter's exhortation to the suffering servants at the hand of Nero was humility, trust, and placing ourselves in God's hands. But we need to be reminded of this, as Dr. Donald Hawking once stated. Christians need to realize that we don't live in the sweet by and by, but rather the nasty here and now. Life gets pretty rough sometimes. Life gets pretty rough sometimes. Our calling unto Christ will most often involve some form of rejection, persecution, and opposition from the world. If you've lived before people with a real testimony, you've already experienced that. I don't need to tell you what it's like. You may be set aside for the promotion. You may be mocked at the water cooler. I remember people used to call me when I worked at Union Carbide. I worked in a separate part of the building, and they used to call me, and I'd say, hello. And they'd say, hey, is this dial a prayer? And then they'd hang up. They would make fun. I remember going to lunch one time, and one of the guys said, hey, let's all pray. And he goes, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, praise God. You know, just, just to humiliate. That's okay. Jesus changes lives, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. One of my favorite songs I love the version that Selah did. Daniel Burris, you're the one that recommended Selah to me over 20 years ago. If you haven't ever heard Selah or heard their albums, they're really worth getting. But it's Be Still My Soul. Listen. Be still my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief and pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways, leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Their hope Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. And now, mysterious, shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know his voice, who ruled them while he dwelt below.
we have the Lord Jesus Christ as our example. We also need to recognize, as did this early household servants, that we are called to suffer. But Jesus is at our side. Amen.